Lieutenant Governor Michael Fidelli is here with specifics. He's laid out a plan to get Connecticut working again. Also, the Travelers Championship is just around the corner. We're going to talk about its lasting impact on charities around the state. And then we're going to get back on the course and see who is headlining in Cromwell this year and what's new for fans. You're watching The Real Story. I'm Lori Perez. The candidates in the crowded field running for governor are trying to distinguish themselves. All say they're going to make the state a better place to live and work. How they'll do it is where they often part ways. Eleven candidates for governor, seven Republicans and four Democrats, went head-to-head -head this week in back-to-back -back debates at the UConn Law School in Hartford. We have an extraordinary opportunity now to put in place good governance. And good governance is based in accountability. I think it speaks volumes that you're having an opportunity to see this number of candidates interested in taking on this challenge. A lot of candidates with a lot challenging them, of course, on a university campus. The first question for both debates would be about tuition, how to keep it low. We asked the question about affordability in higher education. I think that the point is, is that we don't treat it as a cost. We treat it as an investment. I'm going to say one thing that's completely unpopular, and I'll be lucky to get off campus alive. But the first thing we're going to have to do is look at the benefit level to incoming professional staff members in our CSU system and in our UConn system. I would actually have a tuition free, full tuition free program for kids who have a B plus uh, grade and are enrolling in community colleges. This is going to be a massive undertaking by all of us. Uh, we have to balance the budget. We'll probably end up financing uh, some of it as we have in the past. Uh, but uh, this will be the most difficult year in Connecticut history. The next question stayed on the money theme. Can you fix Connecticut's $4 billion deficit without tax increases? Revenue is not the answer. That's the easy cop-out. That is the cop-out that's all the time. Well, we can just raise taxes and do that. We cannot do that. We have to do a line-by-line -line look at the budget. We do not have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. Businesses that go through uh, down cycles uh, frequently take 5 or 10 percent out of their overall budgets uh, in a down cycle. Uh, this uh, government can uh, get that done. Last thing I'll say, it's about attitude. It's about restore restoring confidence. It's about restoring optimism. It's about giving people the, f the idea that the future is ours uh, to hold. This will be an election focused on the economy, and candidates on both sides know they will be money managers and marketers first and foremost. We'll install tolls. We need revenue. We cannot address this issue Gosh, without revenue, it's impossible. It's time to say, if it doesn't invest in the future of Connecticut, we don't spend it. I'm the guy who goes around the state and calls, declares what's going on in the Capitol, uh, a bipartisan train wreck. Uh, we have uh, tolerated the creation of structural deficits uh, that have absolutely nothing to do with the downturn in the economy. And Lieutenant Governor Michael Fidelia today is here to talk more in depth about the issues and his candidacy. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, hello, Lori. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. Now, first of all, those debates we were just talking about, those, um, while well-meaning and helpful, are so limited because of the 60-second uh, response. I mean, sure that's, that must be very frustrating for you. It's very frustrating because it's very difficult in 60 seconds to get out an answer to a question very comprehensively, which is, I think is what the citizens are looking for. But clearly they also play a role in the style and, and, and um, information and comfort that a candidate would have in addressing people. Right. And uh, six minutes is barely better, but that's what we're going to take to talk about the jobs program or the jobs plan that you recently released. And let's start with the tax policy. We heard um, Rudy Marconi, one of the Democratic candidates, talking about revenue. He doesn't think that we can, can uh, address this expected $4 billion deficit without raising revenue. Um, talk about the possibility of tax increases. Well, there aren't any. I mean, that's the interesting thing, and I'm not surprised to hear it from Rudy, and actually not surprised to hear it from Democrats. I mean, that's one of the reasons we are where we are. We spend way too much more than we take in. When you give the democratically controlled legislature more revenue, it's going to disappear. If you go back to the income tax days, we pass an income tax, 
We're never going to have to have a pr- worry about anything. Here we are today. We've spent that money. Government is the only thing that's grown. So we need to take a look at our spending side first before we even look and talk about revenue. If we do that first, which has been the traditional way of attacking budgets in this state, as Lieutenant Governor and actually when I served in the legislature for 10 years, uh, we are going to head it down the same path and bigger problems down the road. And while I would agree with that, that you do need to address spending, won't that just take care of uh, getting us in more debt? But how do we address the hole that we're already in? Well, I think, as I said yesterday during the debate, you really have to sit down and go line by line. Look at what we're spending money on. Make saying, is this the right investment for our state? We don't do that. We pass uh, budgets, or we actually pass programs in our state. And uh, at the end of a year, no one ever goes back and says, well, did this program do what it was intended? In business, when investments are made in whatever they do, they look back a year later and say, did we get accomplish what we did? If, it's, if they did, they continue to invest in it, maybe grow it, and continue on. Or they get rid of it. We don't do that in government. Well, so why don't we do that? I mean, that's a basic we economic should do that. principle. And, and that's clearly something that would be done in a Fidelity administration. We would look at it every, every program, if we did pass programs, irrespective if they cost us money or not, and say, are they working? If they're working, great. If they're not working, why not? And if it's not worth fixing, let's get rid of it. The other thing that I've proposed uh, is, uh, as you know, in, in our legislation, we sometimes ask for a fiscal note on a bill uh-huh. so that the legislators know what the impact financially is on the state. I'm saying that we should also, on any bill or amendment that uh, affects businesses, we should put an e- economic note on there. How many jobs are we going to gain? How many jobs are we going to lose? What's it going to cost? cost businesses in America, and I'm sorry, in the state of Connecticut, because that's very important as we go forward. Right, kind of a cost-benefit Absolutely, analysis. so that the legislators, when they're looking at this, say, gee, you know, if I pass this, here's the impact to, the in, to industry in Connecticut. Is it a positive or negative impact, and what's it going to cost overall? So let's get back to cutting. I mean, are you already seeing programs that if you were governor that you would say, okay, that right there is an example of what we need to cut? Sure, I'll, I'll give you an example, and it was actually, again, brought up in, uh, in our discussion yesterday at UConn. Uh, if you look at our state, uh, uh, Connecticut State University system, we have Eastern, Western, Southern, and Central, right? Each one of those universities has a president, a chief financial officer, administration, curriculum, and so on and so forth. They then report to a central office. Well, that central office costs us $6.5 million. So my question would be, why do we need a central office of $6.5 million when you have each university, in theory, standing alone, performing? And then, quite frankly, you could also say, why do you need four different curriculum directors when, in theory, they have the same curriculum, per se. But I've heard kind of that same argument um, on the local level with school budgets, which are so mm-hmm. tasked this year as, as well. And they're saying, for example, when a town has two high schools, they're saying, well, why do we need two um, heads of the history department? Whatever curriculum is developed at this high school, we should install at this high school. And the thing, frankly, that it comes down to is people are hesitant because that means that someone's going to lose their job or someone's going to lose their, you know, so-called uh, position as mm-hmm. the chair of the history department. Mm-hmm. Um, well, but I mean, you know, if you look at any budget in business and in government, your largest line item is personnel and benefits. Yes. Okay? So what we're saying is there are going to have to be some cuts. There are going to have to be things you look at. It's, un- it's an unfortunate thing. But also, there are opportunities. And another example you asked about where you would do it, if you look at social services, uh, in the three and a half years as lieutenant governor, I've been out there to group homes and not-for-profits. And I can tell you, in many cases, uh, those group homes and not-for-profits do a much better delivery of service than we in government ever do. So the question is, should we be in that business and should we not let private providers and group homes and those not-for-profits do that business? Now, if you then take that business and move it into the private sector, they're going to need more employees. Those state employees can be part of that world. Right. Interesting. And and I'm sorry because this is going by so quickly already, but let's get right to um, what has been called in the past the brain drain because you have some good ideas, um, some interesting ideas about how to keep grads in Connecticut. Sure. Well, the first way to keep grads in Connecticut is make sure there are jobs here. And it's interesting. The University of Connecticut did a study a couple of years ago, and uh, we have a sense that we believe that once kids get out of school that they immediately leave the state. And what they found was that's not the case. They'll stay here, but then there's no upward mobility for them, and they go somewhere else. And that's because... Companies and businesses aren't growing here. We need to put together a pro business environment in Connecticut where businesses want to grow here, create those opportunities so our children can stay here and have jobs here. Um, if we don't do that, they will continue to go to other states. And, and that's the issue. And, and the way you do that is by incenting businesses to do R&D here, to, um, to grow here, uh, let them use their tax credits. Because remember, the only way you get a Connecticut tax credit is you invest in Connecticut. Right. Why not have them invest here instead of Georgia or out in Iowa?
Right. Unfortunately, our time is already up, but um, your new jobs plan is available on your website, which is? Fidelity. 2010.com. And I, I did uh, read through it today. It's about eight, nine pages, a lot of um, interesting ideas, and we wish you good luck. And, and with very specific. Too. Yes, very specific, uh, which unfortunately is not always the case in those debates. Yes, I understand. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much for being here. Lori, thank you. Thanks. Up next, Connecticut's Tea Time is coming up, and Connecticut charities are always the winners.